Good morning. Uh, we're here in uh, sunny San Francisco. I'm here with my old friend uh, Jeremiah Aoyang. Good to see you, brother. Um, we are uh, going to talk about some of the new research that he has coming out of his uh, crowd, uh, crowd company study. Um, but figured we'd just kind of chat for a few minutes while people are piling into the, to the webinar and, uh, and set the stage for what we're going to talk yeah, about. Yeah, let's chat. Um, so we, Jeremiah and I met many years ago, I don't know, what, nine or ten years ago? Yeah, now? that sounds about right. And uh, I, I credit Jeremiah with being one of the first people that I've ever uh, known that really recognized the impact of uh, social media as it pertains to corporations. And nice. at the time, people were doing blogging and stuff like that, but really <laughs> companies weren't really doing it. And, and he started at Hitachi. Um, really being this public face of a company from not from the sort of strategic communications team but from like you know the meat of the organization and talking about what's going on inside and outside thanks uh, that company. feels like eons ago <laughs> when the dinosaurs roamed the land I don't, you, you still look good so it's, thanks uh... and you too thank you <laughs> just staying, but, staying out of the sun behind computer screens does yeah. wonder for you wonder for your skin all that fluorescent light yes. is great uh, but um, but yeah, he really opened my eyes to that um, um, at a at an interesting time, and this was kind of pre Twitter, and now like and now this... Facebook makes a billion dollars in profit a month, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and people say that's a fad. <laughs> yeah. um, so and then tracing the the rest of uh, you know your career as I as I know it, you spent some time as an industry analyst, so yeah. with uh, both Forrester and Altimeter Group. That's right. And uh, and sort of brought those insights that you had as a practitioner to the field and, and to uh, in a more you know sort of broader broader context research base and that's where I learned my research training and I get to show off some of those uh, some of that skill here today as some well chops. yeah cool um, so cool so and and now I don't want to steal too much thunder from from crowd companies but now you've sort of taken all that together the sort of engagement mm -hmm. and the research and and. You're helping big brands um, basically embrace crowd-powered uh, business models, and more true? than crowd, because you know autonomous systems are coming and VR and AI. Yeah. So even crowd companies, and I'll say it out loud, is that that even that the branding of that feels old now, even though I launched the company three and a half years ago, because yeah. at the time that was the most disruptive technologies, Uber and Airbnb and a whole host of crowd-based, and now those companies are launching autonomous systems too. So. Yeah. It really tells us the story, Matt, that innovation is increasing in intensity and frequency. It's not slowing down, even for me. So I think really that's the, 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 the gist of this, is that companies are, these huge giant companies have a ton of cash and capital and have billion dollar revenue lines, but they're worried about these small startups, even right here in San Francisco, that have an exponential growth curve mm -hmm. and, um, it, and a competitor can come out of nowhere. When, when the big car companies heard of Uber, they laughed. When taxi companies, they laughed. When hotels heard about Airbnb, they laughed. Um, but now we can't laugh because these things are becoming, these are billion dollar companies now. Yeah, yeah I always, I, I don't envy the position of an executive who's sort of staring down the barrel of disruption. You know, it's like, because if you're, you know, Kodak's a, you know, typical whipping boy, but, you know, you have all these plants around the world that, you're super efficient making film, and then all of a sudden you don't need to make film anymore, and those things go from being a massive asset to a massive liability. So it's a problem. It's uh, it's I think <laughs> I think they're right to be a little bit scared uh, to uh, right. for, for these. Uh, and and the finding is, and we're going to talk about this in a second. The biggest challenge actually isn't those exterior startups; it's inside of the company. That's that's true. Okay, so we'll get into it. <laughs> we can definitely talk about that. All right. So. I think you guys are going to love this uh, next uh, hour. Um, Jeremiah is full of insights, and they sort of pop out, uh, you know, several times a second. So uh, I want to I want to get right into that. Um, so uh, I'll just let you take it from here. But we should let folks know that if they have questions, I'm sure there's a lot of smart oh, people absolutely. watching. They should use the chat feature in um, the online tool. I'm not tweeting at me because my our phones are actually off right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll be monitoring the bright idea and, and uh, crowd companies. So if you have a tweet there, we'll we'll pick it up. But uh, we'd love for you to just put stuff right into the Q and A tool, um, and then we'll be taking questions at the end. All right. So let's get into it. Let's uh, hit it. Okay. So getting into the slides, um, the first thing to note that this is research that we interviewed 46 large companies, over a thousand employees, uh, very big companies. And we surveyed over 60 of them to get all this information and data. This research was completed around December last year, 2016. 
and uh, let's take a look. Uh, so the overall findings is that companies are trying to act like startups, but hold on to their core composition as big companies, and they're launching innovation programs in 10 different ways. We'll cover about seven or so of them today. And inside of these programs, um, the biggest challenge actually really wasn't external, it's with internal culture trying to change these things. Now we found the most advanced companies in innovation, they actually enabled their whole ecosystem to innovate, including their competitors. So right there, there's a few insights. The biggest challenges are inside, and the most sophisticated companies help their competitors. Wow, okay, let's take a look. So you're probably wondering, I'm a big company, we make a billion dollars a year, we seem happy, we are in a, we're on our ivory tower, uh, sitting up, looking over it, and there's a bunch of startups that are moving very fast. About 90% of those startups will die, but, and about five of them will acquire, 5% will acquire, 5% are gonna hurt us. Which ones are those, what can we do? And so we asked companies, what are you doing about this? And so uh, we, we surveyed them uh, to find out um, what is the biggest challenges. And uh, the number one thing is internal culture, trying to get the company to actually be open to this change. The following uh, responses were also around, um, I don't know if you can see that format, <laughs> but I'll tell you, it's about uh, competing internal agendas. So there's this term that was used in the, in the interviews, we heard this over and over, that the innovation leaders were fighting internally with uh, a group of middle managers, and they often called them the frozen tundra, <laughs> or the, the permafrost, or um, the antibodies, like to fend off an innovation scourge, or uh, an innovation <laughs> infection, or bacterial uh, growth. And the innovation leaders often felt like they were foreign bodies trying to penetrate the, the organization. And so the, that was the biggest challenge. And uh, in addition to that, the companies are measured on quarterly performance in the billions of dollars. And you have innovation leader that might have a budget of maybe $100 million or less, and they can't really show success for a few years out or a longer period than a quarter. And so those, it's an apples and oranges comparison. And then new leadership comes in top, new CEO or CMO, and they say, what is going on here? Why are we spending money here? The primary business is over here, we're wasting time. So th there's, those are some of the, the challenges that we often heard. So the net finding is it's the internal struggle. Uh, Matt, you want to add some insight to that? Yeah, I, I can certainly echo that. And, uh, you know, I think sometimes uh, our customers tell us they feel like they're pushing a rock up the hill with, with some of these things. And I, I still admire them for fighting that fight because we believe innovation is something that, that certainly has to happen. Um, one, of the, one of the experiences I've found is that oftentimes they're not speaking the same language. So mm. you, you say, oh, we're going to have an a innovation tiger team and you bring people from the factory floor and you bring people from the corporate venture capital group and you bring people from product development. And they all say innovation and mean different things. You know, the factory floor might mean this incremental Kaizen stuff. Um, the, 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 yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. And the, the, the uh, corporate venture capital group is, is looking for like, you know, huge home runs, you know, like grand slams. Um, that is and, a VC term. Yeah, but exactly. Exactly. And they're, and they're, and then the product development group is, might be doing an incremental, you know, or sort of evolutionary product uh, thing where they offer something in a new size or a new configuration. And they're talking about like design that. sprints and agile. Exactly. And you get them all at the same table and, and they say, you know, well, let's talk about innovation. Let's define innovation. And, and somebody says, over here they say, innovation only happens once a decade and, and you have to lead that. And then the guy on the other side of the table goes, actually, we, we, we constantly do these improvements to our, to our factory uh, production process. So, so just getting them to speak the same language, I think, is half, half the battle because um, you know, if, you, if you just lock horns and you don't communicate well, then you're actually not talking about the same phenomenon or the same process. You're, and, and oftentimes the, the actual innovation can fall in the cracks uh, between those organizational boundaries. Well, I think you set us up nicely. Let's go to the next graphic. And essentially, we found that innovation is being used in four different ways in a company. And th this is, the big insight from this is, uh, when you talk about innovation at your company, be very, very clear on which of these four types you're talking about. And you labeled three of them. Fantastic job. You should be a CEO of an innovation company. <laughs> I think you're going to do really well, Matt. All right, so at the top one is the product innovation 
and this is opt-in iterative design or improvement of a product. For example, I have an iPhone 7, and it was highly criticized because it didn't change that much from the iPhone 6. So, so that's an example of product iteration. The next one is supposed to be game-changing uh, or magical. We'll pick one or the other. Mm -hmm. um, and then the next one is operational innovation. And this speaks to the Kaizen or Six Sigma or you know, Black Belt and operational innovation. And this is improving uh, time to market or reducing costs. That's usually the two. Yep. The third one is customer experience innovation. And this tends to fall in the marketing side or customer care, often not revenue producing. Could be lead generating or cost reduction or customer SAP. But essentially, they are um, maybe trialing today new chatbots or virtual reality or artificial intelligence, new ways or automated ATMs or different ways to interact with customers. And then the fourth one, which I've done quite a bit of research on, is uh, business model innovation. And sometimes people use buzzwords like you know jump the curb or you know exponential or like there's a number of things to do for it and i'll have some examples on that later but essentially when companies like bmw make their cars available for rent in their drive now program that is business model innovation rather than selling the car outright that's pretty significant when whole foods partners deeply with instacart to deliver groceries um, in a deep partnership with the apis and the data and even investments that is business model innovation uh, so that's significant. So those are the four types. Be very clear when you're talking internally, or if you're a consultant talking to corporate, which type of innovation that you're referring to. Yeah, I love the I love the uh, customer experience one because we have a lot of financial services companies come to us, and mm -hmm. you know typically you're thinking about boxes and units and products, and 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 they see the world fundamentally different. You know, and a new product might be this sort of intellectual construct of, of paperwork and contracts, you know, if you're Goldman Sachs or an insurance company. So, you know, they're, they're basically, you know, it, it's uh, oftentimes they're trying to innovate around the actual customer experience. And sure. um, one of my favorite stories was a, a bank was struggling with um, customer satisfaction at their branches. People are frustrated. They don't want to go to the branch anymore. They have to wait in line. And... Uh, and somebody just said, well, why don't we just put up a, a TV with a financial news on it? And like the SAT scores like went up like three points out of 10 because... We're so easily distracted <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> by screens. So I mean, sometimes it's a subtle thing, but, but you know, those, those incremental improvements you make to customer experience, you know, moving towards a, a Virgin type brand experience or a... a, a uh, you mean uh, Alaska you know. Airlines? Yeah, exactly. Sad day for innovation with yeah. that, but... Um, so yeah, I, I, I think it's really important, I agree, uh, to, to segment these things. Um, and different companies may segment them slightly differently, but, but it, it is important to draw those distinctions so that you're not uh, creating uh, confusion when you're talking to different constituents. Cool. All right, let's take a look at the 10 different types of innovation. Um, I know this is an eye chart. There's literally 10 things on this chart. And to make it really clear, at the very top are things that you do inside of your company. We structured this through the interviews. At the bottom are things that you do outside of your companies. The ones at the bottom, frankly, have been around for a while, and they're not as interesting, in my opinion, as the ones at the top. So we're going to focus today on the ones that you tend to do inside of your companies. Just so you know, the ones at the bottom, I'll start at number 10, is acquiring startups uh, which often it could be seven, eight, nine figures sometimes, like uh, uh, Unilever acquired uh, Dollar Shave Club for a billion dollars, so that's a great example. And there's startup investment, so investing in startups. I'll, I'll show you some data on, this, on the investment numbers. And then uh, partnering with universities, which is always great. Uh, but companies are, are well-versed and teams have uh, these in place already, so let's instead focus on the first seven. I'll call them out real quick. So the dedicated innovation team, Number two, an innovation center of excellence. There is a difference. I'll explain the nuances. Third one is an entrepreneurship program. I think those are very interesting. And then open innovation, including hackathons or incubators. And then there's uh, innovation excursions going out and about and touring different locations. And then there's innovation outposts. There's over 300 in Silicon Valley in San Francisco. And then there's uh, partnering with accelerators. All right, so for each of these seven, and we'll go to the first one, I'll define what it is, and then I'll give you an example. And Matt, if you want to chime in to any of them, you're, you're welcome to uh, give sure. some color. Yeah, so think... let's take a look. <clears throat> the first one, a dedicated innovation team. This tends to be a small team that is uh, 
deploying innovation typically on behalf of the company. They might be called a lab, they might be called a tiger team, uh, and they are typically doing the tests. And there's quite of, uh, a few examples of that. Let me show you one. Let's start off in Europe. I don't want to be so San Francisco uh, centric. So this first example is uh, from Swiss Post. And Swiss Post has a small dedicated team that is doing quite a bit. They're testing. Oh, it's, if you don't know Swiss Post, they're like um, the logistics and delivery, and they have some banking and retail arms as well. They're basically the UPS or the FedEx of Switzerland, which is a, a very difficult country to service because, as you might imagine, they're in the Alps. So lots of uh, variations in how to deliver. <clears throat> so they have a small team that is deploying, and they're doing the tests. And they use this term called the speed boats and tankers. Did you hear that term, Matt? I'm not familiar with okay. that. Okay. So we heard this uh, maybe two or three times in uh, um, AXA also uses the term, the largest uh, insurer from France. Speed boats are the small innovation plays that companies are doing, the small projects or the labs or tests. The tanker is the large billion dollar business that the company is, uh, they're known for and their main revenue source. So the, the, they're struggling with balancing in their fleet, this tanker and this uh, speed boat. <clears throat> so that's the first one, and let me do the second one and get your responses on this. Yeah, I'm just going to say the innovation team, innovation program, innovation lab, that's yeah. our sweet spot. That's that's who uh, most of the folks on the call are, are I've speaking assumed that. to. And, uh, you know, I, I think that's a great beachhead. If you're, if you're not doing anything, that's a great place to start. Give people dedicated time, dedicated focus, allow them to uh, experiment and embrace some of these net new models of, of innovation. Um, and then and then prove to the company, you know, it's sort of a speedboat in and of itself. Uh, it is to prove a speedboat. Uh, that 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 this can function and that this this can deliver an ROI back to the business. Good. And at the end of this segment, I'll show some stats around the typical innovation leader. And you are that are watching, you can find out if you are the typical innovation leader. So don't leave. So let's take a look at the number two example. This is called an innovation center of excellence. Now, the strategy here is slightly different. It is typically a cross-functional team, multidisciplinary, and they are actually trying to get everybody else in the company to innovate. So their core responsibility is really not to roll out the projects. They are encouraging, enabling, empowering, coordinating, reporting innovation on behest of every business unit and geography around the globe. Let's take a look at one example. And there's a, quite a few groups that do this. Um, W.L. Gore, you might know them for the amazing uh, chemicals and materials that they make, uh, waterproof materials and more, but they have thousands if not millions of more products beyond what you see in a consumer retail store. Uh, and the group is, uh, the company is a very innovative company by nature. It's filled with scientists and engineers. So. Innovation is already in their DNA. And what they found was there's many different groups that are doing innovation, but they all had different methods and processes. So if you go to my blog, by the way, I did a breakdown of all the different types of innovation from agile to even traditional waterfall to design sprints to the lean. I listed them all out and I have a little matrix comparing and contrasting them. It's, it's quite helpful. But in this case, uh, W.L. Gore decided to standardize everybody on lean startup methodology. And the, that, that was the right method for them. I, I don't, frankly, I don't care which one you use. It really doesn't matter in this particular scenario. The goal is that everybody's consistent. The goal is that you have metrics that all align uh, towards the same thing. So the executives that are funding the innovation can see, are we all uh, aligning our speedboats in the same true north? So that's a, a great example um, of a center of excellence in innovation. Sure. Yeah, we uh, we definitely a little bit of blur the lines on the terminology that we use, but you know our the innovation uh, center of excellence as you're, you're positioning it here um, is typically focused on engagement. Um, they're typically focused on you know broad based uh, uh, participation um, and and also uh, sort of being a traffic cop amongst all these different disciplines and, and making sure that uh, mm -hmm. they're playing well together. Okay, great, and maybe even moving resources from different groups too. So when I, I spoke with Fujitsu and one of their innovation leaders was just looking for unused technologies and pairing them with other groups to take them to market. Awesome. So, and MasterCard is really geo-focused. So um, John Sheldon 
He's amazing, by the way. Very good. He might, guy. He might be watching. <laughs> um, he was coordinating different geos and making sure to report back to corporate. He even hired an internal marketer to report on the innovation that was being done around the globe so everybody could see consistently um, all the new projects and products that were coming out. And I think that's a really, there, you touched on a really important thread there is, is across all of these areas, facets, disciplines, um, the reporting is really, really important because these, these organizations have to prove their worth, prove their value back to the organization. And if they don't, um, you know, they're at risk of getting struck by the, the, the bean counters, uh, red pens. Yep. So, and, I, uh, and I think you have, as an innovation leader, I think you have three years on yeah. average. Yeah. I don't, actually don't have the data on that. That is, my, that is what I'm hearing and seeing. You have three years and that's it, or you go find a new job. Yeah, we can. I can. I can uh, share some data. We have. We call it the Valley of Death, and it's right around the third year. And that's pretty dramatic, by the way. <laughs> it helps me. I a said just dramatic. get a new job, <laughs> Valley of Death, but I, I'll go with Valley of Death. But I think it's. I think it's. I think it's really important because sometimes when people start, they have this sort of support from the organization, and they say, "Oh, I don't need to track ROIs. You know, my boss doesn't require it." They they lose sight of the fact that their boss might change in three years, and you can't go rebuild oh, yeah. three years of history. Right? Um, and so. the tenure of CEOs and CMOs continues to reduce. Exactly. So they then they have to make their business case, and that derails their projects. Yep. Yeah. So I think no matter what which of these aspects you're you're talking about, you want to have a point of view of what the fully burden costs are to run this thing, mm -hmm. and then start thinking about what the impact you're generating on the back end to, right. to prove back to the business. Okay, let's take a look at the next one. So as we move down the list, just to remind, it goes broader and broader and involves more people. Personally, I love this program. I think this is fantastic. This is um, plays to my social roots as an um, entrepreneur program. And this is a program to get every single rank and file employee to innovate. Now, for those in startup land, you're like, ha, ah, we do that all the time. In fact, we had a conference call with my customers, corporate leaders, and with uh, Uber. And one of our members from the financial institution says, how many people are in your innovation team to the Uber exec? It's just silence. And because he's like, we don't have an innovation team. Everybody innovates. Yep. And that's shocking to corporate, right? But you have to remember in corporate, people have specific roles to do one small thing for one product line, and there's maybe a dozen product lines yep. per geo. Okay, so an entrepreneur program is trying to break all of that open and enable everybody uh, to participate in innovation. The leader in the space is Adobe. And we interviewed a number of companies who said, yeah, we have this cool innovation program where people get a box and they, uh, they come to a class and they learn how to innovate. I said, that sounds like Adobe Kickbox. And they said, yeah, we, we took it from them. <laughs> so Adobe is the leader in this space. They are the de facto um, leaders. And one of the reasons why they're the innovation leader is they made the Adobe Kickbox program open source. You can go right now to kickbox.adobe.com and download this whole program. So here's how it works. Uh, you work at a big company and you are working in maybe operations or finance or HR or marketing. You're not the innovation team. But if you have a great idea to help customers, you can go to an Adobe Kickbox class and for a few hours you take uh, the lessons and you learn how to do rapid prototyping and how to pitch to your boss with, and do A-B testing. They teach you the basics. And you receive this kick box, this literally this red box. Inside of it are things like power bars, energy bars, and a power drink, and like some diagrams, and a thousand dollar credit card so you can go test your ideas. Maybe you hire a panel to do survey, maybe you hire, um, you go to a, one of those crowd sites to design a new logo or or you're going to do some um, some testing online or create some uh, diagrams and then you test the a b test and then they teach you to go pitch your boss so here's the difference the entrepreneurship team at adobe they actually do not want you to come back to them and run the vetted ideas through them they don't want to vet it they want you to vet it with your boss because that's how you get a thousand innovation flowers to bloom across the entire organization, is to get everybody to do it. Um, I spent some time with them, I've done briefing calls, and they have ROI metrics, they've had new products go to market, new people have gotten new jobs and careers and got shifted into product management roles. And there's even another layer that they created where you can go to the class and you could get the black box if you're successful with the red one. And, and Matt, I asked the, the head of innovation, um, What's in the black box? Please, I want to know. 
uh, is it, a, is it $10,000? What's in there? He says, I can't tell you, you've got to earn it. Awesome. <laughs> so Adobe's entrepreneurship program is being modeled by many companies that are doing something similar. Yeah, yeah I, I, I picked up on what you were uh, saying about the, the you know, big brands and the big corporates basically coming to Silicon Valley and going, you know, what do you mean everyone, you know, innovates or everyone's the innovation team? And, you know, really, you know, the, the, the startups have somewhat of an unfair advantage because a lot of these big companies we get to work with like GE and HP and Cisco, you know, they've been around for a long time. A hundred years and, or and, often a hundred years. Yeah, and the, the, the 20th century was about doing the same thing over and over and over again really efficiently. But better and better each time. Exactly. But the same thing. Exactly. And and now you have people like the Uber and the Airbnb where you might be doing something new every you know month or three months or whatever, download a new version of the app, et cetera. So, so I think, I think uh, these large organizations have an imperative to transform uh, out of this realm where there's just a small R&D team that does sort of all the forward thinking for the, for the whole company to one where it's diffused throughout the entire organization. Um, and I think these programs like Adobe Kickbox, um, obviously Bright Idea folks have their incubator app um, to, to, to track and manage some of these things. Um, it's a really great way to put a framework around this process. You can't make it a, a disciplined step-by-step -step thing, but you can put a framework around it so that you know how many projects you have going on and, and about how much money you've invested in these and what's coming out the back end. and It's not just totally loosey-goosey. That's right. And you probably won't see a kickbox in a startup. Absolutely right. not, no. Right. Yeah. So let's talk about the advantages of corporate since you just brought that up. I just spilled water all over myself. <laughs> um, the, so yes, startups are great at innovation on demand. However, corporations are really good at efficiency at scale. So this savvy, innovative company is doing both. And that's really what I'm talking about, this next generation of company. Let's take a look at the next one. Let's talk about now we open the doors to folks outside of our companies. And a lot of companies are doing this, an open innovation program. And you might be doing a hackathon or you're hosting an incubator on site. Let's take a look at a company that's not too far from us physically. And this is Wells Fargo. And they are a brand that has been under fire, and they are a very big company, the second largest market cap uh, bank in the United States. They're extremely wealthy, extremely large uh, company. So what they're doing is they're working with startups, and they're hosting startups to join some of their programs. And these are their own accelerator programs. So, and this is a smart move. So rather than just relying on Andreessen and Kleiner Perkins and all the, star, uh, the VCs that are in Sand Hill Road or in, up here in San Francisco, is to do it yourself. And to, but this time, choose the companies that should be in your quote unquote portfolio. And in this case, it's financial services startups, naturally. And, and work with them. And this also means you can help pair them with uh, different business units inside of uh, Wells Fargo, because you know them and you have a better relationship. You might be able to do funding. Uh, this is just one example of many corporations who do programs like this. Comcast I work with um, is doing the same and many others. Uh, I do want to talk about what it, Wells Fargo is doing to change culture inside. So I'm going to shift just slightly. They, they do some creative things. I love this. So every Friday they have Appy Hour. Okay. Appy, like the apps on your mobile phone, right? Mm -hmm. And they use this to teach um, all types of folks, including your executives specifically, on well, here are the latest financial apps that millennials are using. And in one case, they showed an executive like, look, these kids are using Ven Venmo, is that it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, when they share um, the, the bill. Yep. Um, I don't use it, because usually I'm paying. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't split it, I'm, I'm happy to pay. Anytime you go out to lunch with me, I'm happy to pay for you to go to lunch. <laughs> um, so, and the executive saw that, and they said, oh, well, we could do the same. And within a short period of time, they were able to replicate the similar features. Yep. So that's a really good example. And they're also doing reverse mentoring, which has been around for a while. I think Cisco is one of the first companies that I heard of doing that, where they pair senior executives with millennials. And the millennials teach them the latest in tech. Uh, it's kind of like going to your niece or your nephew. And then, but the, but the millennials are learning from the executives the way of the business. So it's really a match made in heaven. Yeah, that's really cool. I can still remember peering over my nephew's shoulder the first time I ever saw Facebook. And he was on his girlfriend's account. and like 
the whole new world just crystallized in my head right there. I was like, wow, this is like, this is big. That's in my dating in 2004. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You don't go up and talk to people. You give them virtual posts. Some, some likes, yeah. Yeah. But I think I think the 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 you know this is a really interesting area, especially in financial services and fintech, because it's a, it's a it's a, it's an it's a crazy conundrum to be in as an executive. You've got billions of dollars in your war chest, billions of dollars of profit, and yet you're still somehow at risk of disruption and 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 mm -hmm. someone turning over the ox card. And you know, financial services, you've got blockchain. You know, you've got peer -peer, big, lending. peer peer lending. I mean, it it's it's really amazing all the the sort of guns that are pointed at the in, right. uh, incumbents. And I think I think it, especially in fintech. Um, the 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 Andreessen Horowitzes of the world who might be funding the next you know muffin delivery mobile app or something may may not always be on top of the 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 stuff that's relevant to say the back office operations of a major you know bank or insurer. So I think I think in these specialized industries in pharma and financial services, it absolutely makes sense to have your own um, incubator. You know, bring the outside in and and uh, and work with those companies directly and. And and they the companies benefit too because they've got direct access to people who can champion the solution when inside the organization. That are the great points. Let's take a look at another example. So often what companies do is they take excursions and they visit tech centers, and that might be Paris or Berlin or London or New York or Singapore, Shanghai, Hong Kong. Um, and uh, let's see. Oh, oh yeah, San Francisco. <laughs> By the way, there's this this misnomer that San Francisco is part of Silicon Valley. Just for historical record, Silicon Valley is far south in 408 San Jose when the Silicon Wafers and other things emerged when Fairchild. Uh, many before I was born, and and now people refer to San Francisco as part of Silicon Valley. Technically, San Francisco is not in a valley; it's a peninsula. Uh, but I'll just let you understand that it's all considered one thing now. So often we see that executives, often from Europe, are taking tours uh, to Silicon Valley for a week. They could spend 300, 400, 500 euros on these trips, and they bring about 20 executives. And they tour startups. The, the, the usual suspects are on the list, Facebook and Google and Twitter and Pinterest. Those are the ones I most often hear about. And then they also visit startups that are in their market. So if it's in financial services, they'll go to um, maybe Prosper or a blockchain startup or Coinbase. Uh, and then, then often I'm invited to speak at these events and they'll probably come visit you. I'm sure you've had many delegates come through as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, we, we had a uh, group come in through, from AXA, uh, you know, massive uh, yeah. insurance company in Europe. And uh, what was cool about it was um, they brought people from all over the company. So they brought the, right. the design thinking team, they brought the innovation program, they brought um, the, the lean startup folks, and and those people hadn't even spent much time together. So it, it's also it's a, a way company. to connect the dots internally in a, in a very large organization because you get people out of the day-to-day, -day, you get them uh, you know, thinking bigger about the sort of what they can do as a whole um, when, they, when they all travel together. Yeah, that's great. And AXA, I don't know if you knew this, they're actually the largest insurer in the world. I read in one stat. Yeah. It's amazing to yeah. see that. They're an amazing company, and yeah. they've got a great uh, innovation. Exactly. Yep. And Tebow. Yep. Great. Uh, actually, yeah, let's, we can talk about them in just a second. So let's talk about the innovation excursion. So one of the downsides of the innovation excursion is that uh, companies do all these tours, spend a lot of money, and they don't do anything with it. And it actually starts to get a very bad reputation. And there's some terms that are emerging. And, and by the way, I, I'm an industry analyst. I'm very agnostic. I just say it how it is. So the, the terms that are, are emerging when they criticize these programs is that it's an innovation petting zoo. <laughs> <laughs> have you heard this one? I have heard it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so they come by and they pet Facebook. They pet Google. They don't pet you. They show respect, of course, for that. <laughs> yeah, but they, they, they look at all these startups and they say, ah, we got innovation down. We spent a whole week in Silicon Valley San, slash San Francisco. We know exactly what to do. And they get back to their, their home country or their home base or their, or their headquarters. And they start talking about all these amazing things that they saw and they felt, and they felt inspired. And everybody else looks at them like they have three eyes. And nothing changes. And they go back to their emails, and they get stuck back in the same rut. So let's talk about a company that overcame that. Uh, Fujitsu, they did have a tour coming over from Japan. And they toured uh, Tech Shop, which is a maker space that is um, all over the globe now. And they did a partnership, and they actually built this uh, maker studio with some of their technologies in it. And they were able to move it around different Silicon Valley locations and encourage people to 
try these things and do brand um, um, ambassadorship as also develop new products. So that's an example of actually going to market and doing something with it rather than just doing the, the innovation tour slash petting zoo slash um, what, uh, what other negative term comes out of that. Yeah, I would say, you know, push for to extend this tour if you can. Uh, we just had a customer in um, from Detroit, works in the auto parts industry, and was here in Silicon Valley for an extended period of time over, over months. Really got to know the ecosystem, really got to know um, the, the, the players, and there's all sorts of new technology, you know, coming out around autonomous vehicles and, and mm -hmm. radar systems, et cetera. So, um, you know, I, I definitely think if you can extend the stay or go, you know, slant towards the uh, outpost model. Um, and if you can't, I think it's a great idea to say we, we have to make something actionable when we come back. We haven't been successful unless we bring back something physical or some, some activity. To, well, let's to... talk about the outpost. All right. So that is the next one. Nice, nicely done, Matt. And the outpost is a physical location set up. And look at that icon. That really says what it is. Like <laughs> setting up a, a, uh, this outpost in the the wild west wilderness with a bunch of you know, tech uh, hipsters around, uh, wild tech hipsters. So you set up an innovation outpost and it's usually uh, just a few folks and let's take a look at an example of that. And I think for this one is, it is Accent, yes. So Guillaume and his team, it's a small group, less than five people, they are staying in a WeWork location. And their job was to vet startups in this space, financial services, and they uh, had a massive a massive innovation funnel that they actually um, vetted 600 startups, but they only brought around six of them back to Paris. Mm -hmm. So that's a tremendous amount of work, and so credit to their team uh, to, to actually find those several needles in this haystack and figure out who and how to partner with. And they, uh, I think, were very savvy about how they spent their money and they were in a co-working spot. They didn't go by their own location that I know. And there's other companies that are spending millions and millions of dollars setting up innovation outposts that turn into just actually offices, frankly. And that's cool too. Uh, almost every single auto company has their own large lab with hundreds of people now here in Silicon Valley because this is like the new motor city. And so they have not just an outpost, it's a full-fledged department at this point and that's uh, appropriate for the situation. So this is a nice foothold as you move into the wilderness, the innovation wilderness, is to set up this outpost. Now let's talk about the downsides. These, um, the, they can quickly become decoupled from corporate. The, the cultures are very different. Like, uh, need I say more people dress very casual? I'm wearing a t-shirt <laughs> under a blazer, so is he. Uh, versus in Paris, it's you wear a suit with pocket, tie, uh, pocket squares. It's a very different culture. And so you have to make sure that there's an executive that is planted often in the outpost for a period of time and have the right blessings and make sure that that, that continuity of the information. I have often heard from innovation outposts that find startups and they bring them back to corporate and make introductions, but corporate has nothing, they have, they have no idea on how to integrate or to work with these startups or the ideas in any way. The, the, there's a breakage there in between the culture and understanding. So again, a lot of the the challenges are getting everybody else in the company. Don't go set up an outpost and isolate yourself from corporate. That is the worst thing you're going to do because you're going to be in the valley of death in three years. Yep. Okay. Yeah, I think there's some interesting uh, vignettes on our side here. Um, certainly GE has made massive investments in Silicon Valley. They've got a whole software unit here, you know, driving towards this industrial internet of things. Mm -hmm. And they, they really are just... Saying we're not we're not a hardware uh, company we're a we're a you know bundled solution company uh, including all the software and all the smarts that goes into this stuff and they see it as a, a way that's a big footprint approach and they see it as a way to really grab the best talent you know coming out of Stanford um, and Berkeley etc. Um, I've also I've also would say for people who want to start smaller than that well also big on the big level uh, British Telecom is very robust outpost here been here for many years constantly betting startups seeing how they're relevant back to the mothership um, back in the UK. Um, but I've also seen ways to get started you know, somewhat inexpensively, and it can seem a little intimidating, like, oh, we're going to send people to another city or another, another region. Um, but the, the ecosystem has really evolved here. You mentioned WeWork. Um, there's a lot of these shared working spaces, um, and you can quickly get uh, you know, an Airbnb or rent, rent an apartment, 
sign up at one of these WeWork spaces and they're not just giving you a desk. There's an ecosystem That's there right. and there, there are people who are managing your network and your relationships mm -hmm. so that you can say... We um, have social hours and cocktail and beers there to yeah. encourage you to have those serendipitous relation, uh, new relationships. Yep, right? and they'll do they'll do a project for you where they'll scan databases to find the startups you should be talking to. Yeah. So it it's not pure wild west where you just plunk down and you got to figure it out. There is some uh, infrastructure uh, and, building. And up there's a lot of groups too. So there's um there's a European group called I think it's called Mind the Bri Mind the Bridge. I think okay. that's one. Okay. And then also uh, my friend Jira Haldine. Um, of La Web fame, she has the refiners. So if you're French or European, there's those groups as well. And th there's a Nordic group as well in Palo Alto. So there, uh, and the Dutch consulate has been very helpful. I've met with them a few times. So your own country can help you often have those as well. Yeah, I was amazed when I met the folks from Swissnex here in San Francisco. Right, that's a great and it, spot. it's like a, it's like having a U.S. Em it's like having an embassy for technology. Well, they're you know, literally they're, next to the Swiss embassy. Yeah, it's pretty literally. awesome. So. Yeah, so that's a and Nestle is in there called the Nest, so yeah. that's a good example. Okay, so let's take a look at some uh, some stats. So th those are just examples I wanted to bring. There's more as well in the report, and we'll have a link so you can download um, and learn about all ten. And so here's some data about which programs are in place. And this is around 60 folks in the in the quantity here of these large companies. And then obviously the teams are in place. And then towards the bottom, you know, outposts are less used, and open innovation is less used. And acquisition is less common because it's expensive, frankly. So, frankly, this is um, kind of what I expected. There's no major ahas out of this. Uh, I'm not surprised by any of this data. So let's take a look at the next one. This one is around uh, budgets. Now, caveat, caveat. Don't take a screenshot of this and run to your CFO and say, look how much money these companies have. There's actually, uh, these are annual budgets but with these are averages. There's still a wide range when we talk to companies. And also, not every company gave us their data, and some of the sample sizes for some of these are small. So I need to run this a few years to actually get the, the right amount of data. So um, the data set is somewhat suspect, and I'll be just want to be open about that. But I think we, what we can do is look at the patterns. That, I think that's more important. So the um, vast amount of money, is spent on startup acquisition. So if you are in corp dev or biz dev, uh, congrats, you have the biggest purse strings because you're acquiring startups. But again, we saw that the frequency is a lot less, and that makes a lot of sense. Next is the teams that are put in place, the uh, dedicated teams. So uh, this is the programs and the budgets for headcount, whether it's the innovation team or center of excellence. And out of that would probably come your budget, Matt, for Software would probably yeah, come out of that. We would call that a funded innovation lab where there's there's people and resources to work on the projects that they want to work on. It's mm -hmm. not looking at the broader organization yet. Yeah, so there's your market cap. So about 40 M per company in innovation. So you can take a piece uh, out of that. Sounds good. All right. And then we have entrepreneurship programs. And that includes the funding of the projects that also come out, come out of that. And then less is a startup uh, um investments and then it just kind of dwindles down. Innovation tours, that that looks like you could do about one tour a year, it's actually not, or two maybe with a small group. So that is exactly what I would expect. And, and a, a part of that budget comes to pay me as a speaker. So great, let's grow that one as well. Let's go to the next one. Let's talk about who's running these programs. So uh, we analyzed over, I think it was 120 LinkedIn profiles of people that had corporate innovation roles at large companies, a thousand people, a billion in revenue. And we found that these innovation leaders often were in their role for about three years. Although they are mid-career, they're around my age, they tend to be in their 40s, around 18, late 30s to 40s. But they've worked in many industries, around three industries, so they have a diverse background. So I think the story here is they're being pulled in from the outside to shake stuff up. Yep. Yeah, this is a topic I love talking about because one, I... I love our customers, and that's that's not just marketing speak. I really do, and you know, this is I really admire the people who take on this role. Sometimes they volunteer, sometimes it's thrust upon them, um, and they're willing to fight this fight to get these like sort of fight. yeah, this these legacy uh, organizations to to transform. And I, you know, I'm I'm just really blown away. You know, they tend to be sort of corporate mavericks, or they tend yes. to have worked on a successful innovation project, um, like taking something to market, and then someone says, 
can you help us do this more often and, and scale And, and I've also noticed that they're often former entrepreneurs, they, and they can go out and do a startup too. They don't actually need to deal with the BS that corporate is giving them. They could actually go out and start their own company and get funding. Yep. So it is a real special breed that wants to do and fight this fight inside of companies. Yeah. And, I, and I find that they get pretty frustrated. One of them in one of our, um, I run a, a innovation council or club, and, and we let them talk freely amongst each other. And some of the, one of them says, I'm here to disrupt I was hired to disrupt my own company, and I'm going to go do it. Uh, I'm just very gung ho about it, and I'm not worried about my job uh, because I'm not banking on my my employment. I'm in banking. I'm banking on my employability. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I find the people who are really successful in this role um, take sort of the velvet hammer approach that they they want to velvet shake. hammer. That's a new one. <laughs> they want to take. They want to like you know. They want to shake things up, but they know they're going to have to do it in a very seductive sort of um, you know, palatable way, and and uh, the the people I think you have it here that they're sort of connected inside the business. Um, they they've been at the sometimes they've been at the company for a period of time, and they know the, the 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 existing power structure. They know what levers to play. They know how to align projects with key customers. Um, and you know, you have to be able to build bridges inside the organization because if, as you said earlier, if you just do this as an enclave or a, you know a few people on an island, it's it's, it's not, not it's enough. Not you actually work. have to change culture. That's why I'm a big fan of the entrepreneurship program because yep. that can really change culture. Let's take a look at some other stats. Uh, we'll be very quick with this. Um, about 60% of them have innovation in their title. We found that the chief innovation officer that is not a major role. We do not hear of many companies having that role. And actually, I, I kind of worry about that that title because that is. Suggesting you're getting paid 500k, 700k in comp, you, you're a target. You're a major target if you have that title. You probably work at a Fortune 100 if you have that. So maybe that's a, it's it's acceptable and you can get away with it. But again, we know the tenure of these roles is around three years before the ROI um, bean counters start coming around. So only three percent of folks that we looked at had the chief innovation officer title, and I don't expect that to grow. Um, and, and then also. The education level of this group was extremely high. I actually have not seen such a high um, education uh, level um, outside of the executive track. So there's like 99% bachelor's, undergrad, and 46% had an advanced degree. Yeah. So very smart group, and they're really good looking too. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have to really stay abreast of everything that's going on here, right? I mean, it's it's not like you're turning the crank on a, on a standard production process or something. You exactly. know, these people are constantly scanning for new developments, new, new things that are going on. And I think that, you know, I, I have a friend who turned down a chief innovation officer title, um, still sort of de facto does the role, but uh, he was afraid of being all hat and no cattle. Exactly, um, right. Uh, right. But I do all think, wings, no feet. Yeah, I do think as these pockets of innovation, I think acts is a good example. Where you where you have a lot of different teams doing a lot of different things, um, you know, design thinking team and a lean startup team and a continuous improvement team and an intellectual property team. I do think there's a, a role that will evolve over time, um, and just to be a traffic cop amongst all those functions that add up to innovation, because you know there's a lot going on and 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 uh, you know setting the overall strategy, you know, setting your approach to innovation. Are you going to be a fast follower? Are you going to be at the vanguard? Um, there are some big questions, making sure there's a budget there, making sure the organization's getting an ROI for the budget, being accountable for disruption. Mm -hmm. I think eventually that role, you know, fills out, um, but it's still early days in my opinion. It is. Uh, to add on to this, when we when I interviewed these 45, 46 uh, individuals, the, one of the first questions I asked them, um, this is an ironic thing, it's a little sad too, so brace yourself. <laughs> uh, one of the first questions I said is, can you define innovation? And often there was long silences and pauses. Even though they had the title in their name, they were unable to define it. Sure. Uh, the really advanced companies were able to say, innovation is doing something new to solve customer needs. The two insights there. Often it's in conflict with your current business. New for customer needs in conflict with your company. So that's what we heard. So when you're setting up strategies and objective, those are like the, the types of folks that they need to understand what is their real goal yeah. on those things. Yeah, I think we talk about innovation, something new that creates value, and that 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 is a big, pretty big tent that brings in, you know, the 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 corporate venture capital guys all the way down to continuous improvement or just right. making an upgrade to your HR system or something. That's like right. That. So it comes in different flavors. 
So really, that's all the, um, well, let's be brief. Let me skip to, to the last bits here uh, very quickly. Um, so some of the things that we heard that experts said in the research, let's go to the next one. Here's what they suggested that other companies do is make sure you have the right innovation processes and methodologies in place before you actually uh, make decisions. So what type of innovation methods are you going to be using? And also we found that folks leave very fast. Uh, they get pulled out or they, they get frustrated and they just decide to leave. So the tenure of these innovation folks is very short. And so if you're going to launch an innovation program, make sure that your people are here. And then finally, make sure your, com your company is comfortable with these smaller projects, these speedboats, and they are allowed to run for a period of years before the, um, they're pulled off. But it, it, some companies said, we're, within six months, we know the KPIs we're looking for, and if it's not on that track, we're gonna kill it really fast. So we've heard lots of different things on that. So I think that should really help you make, get the right design processes, make sure you, your staff doesn't leave, and uh, make sure your culture is comfortable, even through multiple CEOs and CMOs, that you can run these projects which are not going to show quarterly results the first quarter out. It may be the 16th quarter out. So that's one of the challenges here. Cool. So we have a couple questions. Uh, right. Thanks for ripping through all that, set the stage, and maybe we can just chat here for the remaining uh, minutes. Um, uh, there's a question here from Remy in Canada. Um, there's a lot of talk about the innovation program, but what about the biggest challenge fostering or enabling the innovation, uh, internal innovation culture? I know this is you know, your, your number one uh, thing, because we talked about it even before we started, but any tips or tricks that you can share about um, sort of shifting the culture in these organizations? Sure, so let's take a few um, of the things from the playbook that we saw is to start doing those innovation excursions and, and tour different places where innovation is happening. So do that, and that doesn't cost a lot, although it costs a lot in time uh, to get that and structured and to do those tours. Um, the other thing is we talked about some of the, the strategies that Wells Fargo is doing, Appy Hour or reverse mentoring. Those are things to start building this. There's one retailer in the Midwest, uh, United States, that actually has a fail Friday where they encourage innovation teams to talk about what did not work and they make it that it's not no longer a taboo. Uh, and this way, the, the natural reaction of failure in a big company is to hide it, like put it under your, your vest and don't talk about it. But that means the next business unit is going to do the same thing. Yep. Whoops, that's not good. So encouraging that open discussion. And lastly, what MasterCard does is they have an internal marketer who's excellent at internal social media marketing using whatever collaboration tool to talk about all the innovation changes that are coming. And then once you advance to that, you can move to maybe an entrepreneurship program uh, to get your culture right. But I think the biggest thing is this. Your executives have to be okay with failure when you go to Facebook, I don't know if any of you have been there, but on the walls, there's posters that say, fail fast, fail forward, just fail. Yeah. Try to find a big corporate that has a poster like that. I, I have never seen it, yeah. and I've visited quite a few. Yeah, I, I always think about culture with, with respect to innovation as, as starting a fire, and, and you, know, you have a little bit of tinder and a couple sparks, and you don't have much. You know, typically, these teams don't have a ton to start with. Um, and they got to get just enough going that they can put on a slightly bigger twig or branch, and eventually you got the the logs roaring, and you get the thing up to a to a bonfire. So, you know, I and I and I also think part of that building the fire is speaking the language of business. Um, oftentimes, the people who go into these innovation teams uh, may be interested in new ideas and creativity, less interested in accounting and financials and and stuff like that. So. But the, the, you can make an unassailable business argument for this stuff if you're willing to have the discipline of recording every dollar you spend and every net benefit or, uh, that, that you bring back from it, either in terms of revenue, cost savings, cost avoidance, um, et cetera. And we've seen some great examples of that. So, you know. What about the soft metrics, too? Like, Intangibles, yeah. Do you think those are valid though? Like, like I, I think learnings they, or avoiding disruption? Do, do execs even care about those soft measures? Um, you know, I think you got to be careful about getting. You know, I think engagement can be interesting if you get like, let's say, an exec is in in a financial services company and and says, I want people thinking about Bitcoin, right? If if you can quantitatively show that people discussed Bitcoin, um, that's valuable because he knows that his message has gone, it's not just a speech, it's gone out, it's gone into their heads, it's round-tripped and come back and, and they're, they're starting to collaborate. So when there's a big 
you know, strategic shift. It's 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 good to to get those conversations going and to have data that people are actually in, engaging with these these trends and these forces that are that are shaping markets. Um, but I think I think that there's uh, I think there's some I, when I think about culture, I think it's the first thing and the last thing. It's the first thing because you got to think about it um, right from day one. But then you go into this like kindling thing where you can't really stay focused on culture the whole time. You got to put numbers on the board. You got to you got to show ROI, and then eventually you're building towards transforming the entire uh, culture. But um, it's it's somewhat uh, counterintuitive to say the best way to transform our culture is to prove we're we're driving business benefits because that's going to give us more funding to to drive the culture initiative. If you're just two people, you know you're not going to have that and, and much. The, the, the dollars you're putting up are. are Tiny, minuscule compared exactly. to the primary revenue stream. Exactly, it's inconsequential. Exactly. So you have to you have to start to show that that you can do some of this thing. I think crowdsourcing is a is a lever there because a, a two person team can touch tens of thousands of people and and those people can feel more engaged right. uh, in in the entrepreneurship or open innovation. Yeah. Eventually, it goes back to what you were saying earlier. You want people to think like Uber and Airbnb that everyone is an innovator, everyone can create positive change in the organization. It's just you gotta you gotta be on a journey to get there. It's not yep. gonna happen overnight. All right, so um, we'll look at some other questions here. Uh, should employees be rewarded for their participation in entrepreneurial innovation with tangible items, cash, gift cards, etc., or is the intrinsic motivation of participation high enough? Ha, huh. um, and that's from Ira of Engagement Partners. And you missed one, like um, like. Um, Royalties from the product that you that you build, sure. and so the answer is unfortunately no. You you don't get royalties or revenues. I think that's a mistake because when you sign the employment contract, all of that is owned by the corporate. However, some corporates allow their employees to innovate on projects outside of the IP and encourage that. So I've seen programs even at Hallmark that have done that, and that's really exciting. So because they have many artists, so they don't want to own all of the art or IP because that discourages that behavior, uh, and so the. The benefit that I've seen at Adobe is people get promoted into new roles, and this has been um, very helpful. And there's lots of um, internal um, encouragement, and you're rewarded um, in your career because people see you're a mover and shaker. So I do think that's the one of the better ways. Of course, yes, there's trinkets and prizes and things that you can get for successful things, but nothing often matters more than um, the internal fame and, and feeling good. And, and we are often driven by that in many cases. Uh, but in one case, we I met um, a individual contributor, a software person, and she got promoted to a product manager, and so that that is a pretty big reward. Yeah, yeah. It's funny when I started as an entrepreneur, my dad said, "You're going to learn more in three months than you have in three years at, at your normal Very company." Wise. Very so, wise. so no matter what you do, even if you you know fail, like this this uh, this risk that you take on in your career um, is going to inform you know future roles for. Years and years. So um, I think there's lots you can do. Um, how about uh, we go to Julia? What are some of the best examples of how companies celebrated uh, innovation successes? Um, I think we kind of just covered some of that. Yeah. Um, I wanted to. There's one other thing I wanted to cover on the incentives part that I didn't quite get to. Um, you know, I see innovation as sort of a patchwork within an organization. So as I've mentioned. You have corporate M and A and corporate strategy and venture capital on the one hand, and then new product development and the factory floor on another. Mm -hmm. And I do think cash rewards work in some settings. So if you've got hourly people or or um, union people on the factory floor, and you want them, they're actually a really rich source of ideas and, and frustrations that can be improved in the production For process. Operational yep. innovation. Exactly. Okay. Um, but but so I do think uh, the the direct cash awards uh, work really well. And one of the uh, areas I've seen where that uh, celebrating success works really well is when the the CEO or the the GM of the plant comes down to the factory floor and, and shakes that person's hand, and everyone notices when that person's walking on the floor. All the it's like the meerkats; everyone's head pops up and, and says, "What's going on?" You know, so um, it it really says something about uh, the, the the support from the top down uh, in in those cases. Yeah, we've got some more questions here. Um, Maybe we'll take one more. Um, is there a best practice to merge innovation culture with bimodal co culture? Okay, we'll have to define. What does that mean? I don't know what bimodal culture is. Um, uh, maybe someone can put that in there. Um, 
we've got that one. Uh, open innovation. Uh, why is uh, why is open innovation inside the company? That might have. I don't, I don't think we were intending to say that. No, I right. don't think we were uh, saying that. Okay, but actually, let's do some clarification. I did talk about that in the Wells Fargo example. Um, in this case, it was a they were open to the outside other startups innovating, and it was hosted by, in this case, Wells Fargo, versus being hosted by a VC or an accelerator like 500 Startups or Rocket Space or, or elsewhere. So rather than working with a VC, you actually enable startups to innovate in your own house. That's the, the clarity on that. Yep. Yeah, yeah, so I, there's a couple questions on that, so thank you for those. That's the clarity. Yeah, and also William from uh, Rabobank, uh, thanks for joining, I guess, from uh, Holland. Um, the uh, so open innovation can, he he said open innovation can mean innovation uh, with clients too. Can you sure. give an example of that? Um, I, I have one. So. You should. It's probably on your platform. So yeah. let's hear it. <laughs> well, no, I think I've seen this a lot actually in service uh, service oriented businesses. Um, you know, oftentimes these big companies that have uh, long term IT relationships and whatnot, they have these long standing uh, agreements where they're spending. Five, ten, twenty million dollars a year, um, and they're likely going to spend another, you know, five, ten, twenty next year. But the the teams have to figure out what they're going to work on, and that's a collaboration. So, um, you know, the you have the a services organization like an IT consulting firm, uh, Accenture or something like that, um, and then you have a, a large, you know, uh, global multinational, um, and basically they're setting up a collaborative space to have a conversation about what the new projects for next year are going to be. Sure. So um, as, as things tr bubble up, they, they, um, they set up this co-creation space um, and then... A digital. A digital co-creation yeah. space. Right. And, then, and then they have, when it comes time to say what's going into the contract for next year, they've got this stack rank list of projects that they can, that they can uh, you know, budget against and make things happen. Can we do question three? I think that's a great one to end Sure, on. absolutely. What's a good international benchmark for innovation maturity level of a company? Okay, this is from William at Rabobank. Okay, this is uh, my final insights. We actually have a five-phase uh, innovation maturity framework. So basically, the, the beginning ones, you're experimenting without any clear direction. Finally, you get direction. Then you move into a center of excellence to get other people involved. Then you move to the outside, getting others to innovate with or for you. At the highest level, the most advanced corporations, they innovated by getting the startup and the communities around them to innovate on their own uh, platforms, even if they're competing with them. And the leader of, of that is Johnson & Johnson uh, J Labs. I just did a blog post on that this morning or yesterday. Please check that out. And they have around nine labs around the world, and they have very expensive equipment that's, um, that these health startups and bio startups, biotech, cannot afford to use equipment, billion-dollar pieces of equipment. So they allow startups to rent the space. They do not uh, purchase equity or invest in the startups. It's really, they just want the ecosystem around the J&J &J brand. And they even allow companies that are going to compete directly with the J&J &J products to innovate on their own particular locations. And that is the highest form. When, and I interviewed Melinda Richter, the leader of innovation of J-Labs, and she says she wants all the healthcare boats to rise. And if J&J &J is the largest boat there, then we win. And the, their competitors are nowhere close to doing that. So they win the whole ecosystem uh, around them. So that is the highest form if you can get the whole ecosystem to innovate with you, including your competitors. So uh, good, good luck on that one. And I'll, I'll just add uh, our two cents. You know, a bright idea, our North Star is uh, customer reported uh, net benefit uh, business impact from innovation. So when our customers report back to us that we had this net you know, profit from innovation activities, cost savings, new product revenue and, and profit, cost avoidance, um, and you know, we basically have our, our maturity model ties to milestones in that. If you're, you know, start, expand, uh, and scale, um, at the highest level, we've got companies like GE that are putting up uh, hundreds of millions of dollars per quarter um, in in projected impact and, and realized impact. So um, I think, you know, just like any other business initiative, it, it's great to look at the dollars and, and see how that uh, see if that's an indicator of uh, maturity. Numbers and cents. Yep. That makes sense.
All right, so we are, I'm losing my mic here. Um, we're going to wrap up here. Thanks for everyone who stayed to the end. Uh, a great shout out to uh, all the great brands and people in the crowd companies community. It's been awesome to have you and awesome to have you, Jeremiah. Thank you. And thank you to our customers. We love you. Thank you for uh, allowing us to do work that we love to do every day. And uh, we'll be back in touch with another webinar in the coming weeks. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>